but these corbelled ones will buckle outwards. So they had surrounded them, they get the built it as they build it, they pile dirt up against the walls, and you end up with these massive um, stone corbelled vaults covered by even more massive mounds of dirt to make, make it stable, to hold it down in place and keep it stable. Let us continue. The corbel is one of the four devices that builders have developed for holding up the roofs or upper stories of houses. The other three are the post and lintel, that's like uh, the Parthenon, the arch and vault, and the truss. The truss is interconnected triangles. Each device is best carried out by certain building materials. Brick and stone are suitable for the corbel and the arch and vault. Stone and wood are both suitable for post and lintel. But for the truss, wood alone of the materials the ancient had, ancients had was satisfactory. Hence, different parts of the world developed building styles best suited to the local material. In ancient times, these materials were mainly clay, stone, and wood. Nowadays, of course, with steel and reinforced concrete, we can build structures that the men of old never dreamed of. Mesopotamia, having plenty of clay but no stone or wood to speak of, early favored the corbel and the arch and vault. Egypt, having stone and clay, and Greece and China, having stone and clay and wood to choose from, long adhered to post and lintel construction. It remained for wood-rich Europe to develop the truss. Now we skip quite a bit down. At Giza, Khafra constructed the Sphinx, yes, a colossal lion with Khafra's own head on its shoulders, partly covered from an outcrop and partly built up of limestone blocks. Pardon me. Partly carved from an outcrop and partly built up of limestone blocks. The rest of the outcrop was quarried away for pyramid stones so that the Sphinx lies in a depression formed by this quarry. A Muslim fanatic battered off the nose of the Sphinx about the year 1400. Now, I thought that I had heard that Napoleon's troops had shot that nose off, but maybe not. Maybe Napoleon's troops were quite respectful of the stuff. Besides the Sphinx, Khafra built a pyramid slightly smaller than Khufu's, but it looks even taller than the Great Pyramid because it stands upon higher ground. This pyramid has none of the complicated interior corridors and chambers of the Great Pyramid, only a single underground burial chamber with passages leading to it. There are several ideas about why the Great Pyramid is so complex inside. They think maybe, uh, for example, there are ch changes in plans. S part of the reason might have been to confuse people who are coming in to rob the tome later. Uh, some people did some parts of it, and then other people did other parts of the construction, and no, probably no one person was over the whole thing, but maybe so. You know, all the, all the special interior passages and stuff. They used to go to great lengths to try to prevent the, the robbery of these things. The last Egyptian pyramids were built about 1600 BC. Some think the very last one was made by Amose, the first, A-H-M-O-S-E, but... Uh, by this time, about 70 pyramids dotted the land of Kem. Most of the later ones, however, were filled with rubble instead of good cut stone. Hence, they eroded away to mere mounds after subsequent builders stole their limestone facings. Now, some of the interiors of some of the, some of the pyramids are like that. A guy in the late 1800s, I think, 1880s, I think, drilled into the side of one of the pyramids and blew it out with dynamite. Big gaping hole. Well, very small in the side of this gargantuan pyramid. But there's this big old hole to see what the inside was looking at. And they found out that there's much smaller rock and debris and stuff inside. But that's not necessarily true of every single one of the pyramids. But generally you would think that they wouldn't cut good solid cuts of stone and just lay them all inside of this massive thing. I mean, that's just way more work than would be necessary. You might use good cut stone in the areas where you're going to go in and bore passages later and stuff, you know. But let's continue. Now, there's a place called Kush, Kushite Kings, um, and that's where Ethiopia is today. The Kushite Kings, who copied Egyptian culture and customs, had already imitated the custom of burying kings under pyramids. Back in the Sudan, they continued to build small pyramids for themselves and their queens, clear down to 350 AD, when the Abyssinians overthrew the Kushite kingdom. Remains of 60-odd Kushite pyramids still exist near the ancient Kushite capital of Napata and Merol. 
Robbers broke into all the Egyptian pyramids despite the granite plugs, false passages, and other elaborate precautions of the builders. The Great Pyramid held out until the Caliph al Maimun in the uh, 9th century AD got past the granite plugs by boring through the softer limestone around them. Uh, caring not for relics of the days of ignorance, as Muslims call the ages before Muhammad, he smashed the lid of the sarcophagus and tore Khufu's mummy to bits for the gold that decked it. However, some archaeologists think this pyramid had been robbed long before, about the 23rd century BC, and that the mummy that fell victim to al Mun's greed was not Khufu's, but that of a later intruder. I guess you'd have to know more about the story to see whether that's plausible, because that sounds completely implausible. Uh, you know, well, this Muslim thought he found the Egyptian king, but it was actually just this tomb robber who had gone in there and died. That doesn't sound plausible. The pyramids have long been a fertile source of pseudo-scientific speculation. Many people have made wild guesses about the purpose of these structures. They were ostentatious displays of royal power, vaults wherein the sages of old stored their archives, Joseph's, of Joseph's granaries against the seven lean years, models of Noah's Ark, astronomical observatories, phallic symbols, of course, Masonic halls and standards of measurement. These notions can all be easily disposed of. For instance, the passages inside the pyramids were blocked up as soon as the kings were laid to rest within, so they could not have been used for granaries or stargazing or messianic meetings. Modern archaeology agrees with Herodotus. These buildings were tomes, pure and simple. Some people say they were built by aliens and stuff. I asked a 10-year-old kid the other day, my nephew, I said, I said, where did we all come from? You know, you go back early and early, there's apes and stuff, and eventually, when was there nothing, and what started then? He said, well, somebody had to come here and stop, and he stopped in the middle of his sentence, because he realized, well, if somebody came here to start humans, who was that? And the kid's completely um, innocent of religious indoctrination, fortunately. Some people think that the ancient Egyptians must have used powered machinery like ours to build the pyramids, or even that they called upon occult powers whose secret has been lost. As the modern Egyptian poet Hafiz Ibrahim put it, For they had crafts beyond our ken, and sciences that lesser men lack wit to grasp with dexterous hand, to rich invention wed, they planned, Fair idols, men, might be forgiven for worshipping in hope of heaven. But it's not really so romantic as all that, is it? It's just big piles of stone that were sturdy. It's a good way to build something that's sturdy and tall. Herodotus is responsible for this picture of pyramids being built by modern construction machinery. He wrote, the pyramid was built in steps. After laying the stones for the base, they raised the remaining stones to their places by means of machines formed of short wooden planks. The first machine raised them from the ground to the top of the first step. On this there was another machine which received the stone, and upon its arrival and conveyed it to the second step, whence a third machine advanced it still higher. Now, these machines have a wooden block I've seen some of the ways they do it, and they would rock it back and forth, and put it, when it rocks up this way, put a, a thing underneath it, prop it up, and then have a bunch of men pry up on this side, and put a, another board under that side, and then up, 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 just one board under each side. thing is, it very quickly gets precarious, and it's teetering back and forth on these, these huge, huge, huge tons and tons of, of stone teetering on piles of wooden planks. Not likely. Uh, so that's finished with Herodotus's quote. As nobody has found any trace in Egyptian art, architecture, or literature of anything like these wooden hoisting machines, it is likely that they were merely the fantasy of some guide or priest recounted to the eminent Greek tourist in the hope of extracting extra obolus from him. When Herodotus wrote, Pyramids had not been built in Egypt for more than a thousand years, and it is unlikely that his guides would have any clear idea of the engineering methods of their long-dead predecessors.